Good morning. My name is David Solomon from Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. It's really a, an exciting symposium that I'm really happy to be a part of today. So I'll just jump into my talk. These are my disclosures. And here are the objectives. Really, of course, we're going to be focusing on the impact of P53 mutation really throughout the treatment management and time course of patients with P53 mutant disease. And we'll focus um, a lot on therapeutic strategies, both outcomes to both standard, as well as some new novel agents that are hopefully changing the landscape. So first of all, rapidly identifying these patients is really quite critical. I think you're going to see in subsequent slides, the data is really not questionable as far as how dismal um, the outcomes are for patients with these mutations. And thus really at this point, clinical trial needs to be the first and second treatment option for really all of these patients, if at all possible, because the standard of care is really not good enough. Now, next-gen sequencing can, of course, sometimes take even up to three to four weeks. Now, the kinetics of that are improving, labs getting down to even seven or 14 days. But that being said, there's always a concern for waiting. In this group of patients, you definitely do have time to wait, but are there features that you can look at that may make you think that the patient may more likely have it? And indeed, of course, a therapy-related history is one, but then there are several others. So if you have aberrations of chromosome five, particularly in the setting of complex karyotype, you could see that you have anywhere between a 70 and 100% risk of having a P53 mutation. And you can rapidly do this just with an MBS fish panel, again, typically with a turnaround in less than 24 hours. Additionally, and anecdotally, we had seen for a while, particularly in RAEB patients with an increase in ring sideroblast. This is not the low risk you know, SF3B1 mutant subgroup, that there was a, a quite a striking correlation. So we looked at this in detail, as well as put a, a combined uh, validation cohort from several large centers, including MD Anderson and Mass General Hospital and, and some centers from the GFM. And you can see that in patients that had high ring sideroblasts in the setting of REEB disease, over 70% concordance with the P53 mutation. And again, you can turn this around in typically 24 hours you know, with an iron stain looking for ring sideroblasts. What the mechanism for this is, I think needs to be elucidated, but the correlation is quite striking. Lastly, you can look at P53 immunohistochemistry and I'm gonna highlight that on a subsequent slide. So what about prognosis? So I think it's not really a surprise. Many groups really since the dawn of NGS and MBS have shown that indeed P53 predicts for inferior overall survival, which is what you can see here, and overall likely the highest hazard ratio um, overall for poor outcomes. But a while back now we asked, well, what not just binary mutational analysis alone, yes, no, but is the clonal burden or the variant allele frequency, does that further predict outcomes? And indeed it does. So you can see in patients that have an allele frequency frequency of greater than 40% versus less than 20% that there are quite striking difference. This was nicely validated in a cohort from King's College as well. Now, these work have been validated by several additional groups. So the top data are from MD Anderson with very similar VAF cut points. You can see, again, a very nice separation of outcomes as the allele frequency goes up, the outcomes go down. And indeed, only patients with an allele frequency of less than 20% appear to have the potential for long-term durable outcomes. And then with really eloquent work by the um, International Working Group Molecular Committee by Bernard and colleagues published in Nature Medicine, they look at the allelic state of P53. So essentially having a double hit or biallelic, um, which can be two mutations of P53, can be mutations with alterations of chromosome 17P, such as you know, loss of heterozygosity, um, is often in the setting of complex karyotype. You can see that outcomes are indeed very significantly worse in multi-hit versus one hit, where one hit patients actually surprisingly had outcomes not that different than wild type. Although if you look at the supplement, there is still a very striking concordance with VAF. And so the way I like to think about it is, is sort of, um, I would say, biallelic or equivalent. So the only patient group that may have more beneficial outcomes are patients that indeed have a low VAF, are not complex karyotype, are not biallelic. This probably only represents about 10 to 15% at most um, larger centers. Um, and some of this is enriched in patients with isolated deletion 5Q. So there is a subset that can have a more indolent prognosis, but indeed the clonal burden, the complexity, the allelic status all have striking concordance with prognosis in this group. And importantly, and I think this is going to compare, continue to bear out over time. So we asked the question whether or not sequential analysis has prognostic relevance, both in a total cohort 
of MDS patients, as well as it particularly focus on P53, which is the data that you can see here. So essentially at any time, if you expand your clone to greater than 20%, outcomes are significantly inferior. And then looking at it, um, particularly in the setting of treatment, patients that can achieve negativity have significantly improved outcomes. And this um, was borne out well in a multivariate analysis. And we've actually seen this now in some prospective uh, trials as well. So I do think the achievement of P53 negativity, now this is not even MRD testing. This is just a less than 5% BAF. And I think with um, either molecular barcode NGS or error corrected sequencing, we may even be able to get down to one times 10 to the negative six. Now we need therapies that can get us there, but clearly for P53, the clonal burden is intimately tied with the clinical trajectory of these patients. And I think is a really critical um, endpoint as we look in prospective studies. So what is our standard of care for these patient populations? So of course, really we have one standard of care for high risk, which is essentially almost all P53, about again, 90% will fall into intermediate or higher risk based on IPSSR categories. And what's interesting is, you know, if we look at wild type versus mutant, there's really no difference in overall response rate. It's about 50% was somewhere around the 20% uh, complete remission rate. And there was some early excitement, particularly in AML patients with 10-day decidabine, but really overall, and a, and a lot of groups have been looking at this, response rates are really quite similar. Unfortunately, and this is shown in the table uh, below, is that the survival of these patients, irrespective of HMA, is still significantly poor. When we look at our, our group, this is all prospectively, um, or I mean, sorry, all frontline treatment HMA patients, you could see that P53 mutation um, uh, had actually very poor survival versus wild type. Again, not that surprising. And if we focus on our standard of care of seven-day azacitidine, which has been the only therapy to improve overall survival in randomized phase three trials, we had a median OS of 7.6 months, quite a recurrent theme of, of, of outcome, somewhere between six and 12 months, uh, depending on subset MDS versus AML. But in, unfortunately, irrespective of therapy, the survival is quite poor. Well, what about transplant? I think this has been um, continued to be a very hot, hotly debated topic, given how poor um, the outcomes are. Should these patients even be considered? Of course, a lot of morbidity, mortality with transplant, um, but this is our only long-term curative option. So, so we looked at, again, whether or not clonal clearance prior to transplant matter. And indeed, I think if you first look on the Kaplan-Meier curves on the right, if you did not have clearance, and this again is looking at 5% or lower, that there was essentially no difference in continuing HMA therapy alone. Granted, there was one patient that uh, likely was cured. You could see out, uh, um, you know, nearly at five years. Whereas patients that achieved clearance did have significantly improved outcomes of ultimately bridge to transplant versus um, uh, HMA therapy alone with a hazard ratio of 0.28 and confirmed the multivariate analysis. So again, potentially clearance of P53 may be an optimal decision on what patients should go to transplant, which patients should be considered for trial. I think this work needs to be uh, additionally validated by other centers. Well, what is going on? So of course, we know that P53 drives chemo resistance. This is a sort of paradigm across um, um, all malignancies, but what else? So I, I think there's a number of immune adverse um, issues in P53 in patients. So one is we actually see a quite striking increase in pd one expression on the leukemic stem cells of these patients versus uh, wild type. In this paper, we saw a number of other adverse issues such as decreased activating receptors on cytotoxic T cells, higher rates of certain inhibitory receptors. And then there were increased uh, percentages of some highly immunosuppressive populations, such in this case, ICOS high, PD-1 negative Tregs. You can see a significant increase in mutant versus wild type. And notably, both in the total cohort of patients, although some of this was concordant with the presence of P53 mutation, you could see having a higher percentage of these immunosuppressive Tregs predicted for inferior overall survival, which was um, uh, independent, at least in the total cohort of patients. So, so what else is going on? So I think there's been some question, what's the ultimate impact of P53 mutations, at least in myeloid malignancies, and this is looking at the six most common hotspot mutations, is very clear that P53 induces a dominant negative effect with an ultimate loss of function of the, of the protein. And thus, if we could restore the activity of the, um, you know, basically of the loss of function protein, that would be sort of a critical next step in treatment. And so APR246 or epronetopop does 
is a first-in-class P53 reactivator that can bind mutant P53 and restore a more wild-type conformation, leading to this thermodynamic shift and ultimately activation of cell cycle arrest, apoptosis, normal P53 functions. I think importantly, um, epronetapop also has independent activity. Again, it's spontaneously converted to MQ, which is the active moiety um, of the agent, but it can increase reactive oxygen species. And then in some recent eloquent work can drive some other novel cell death mechanisms such as ferroptosis, uh, which again, how each of these play and how these um, interplay in the setting of combination therapy is some work that we and others are continuing to look at. So this ultimately led to the, the design of a phase 1B2 clinical trial. I'll show you really the, the published phase 2 results. Um, from a tolerability perspective, overall quite well tolerated. It does increase gastrointestinal um, adverse events, particularly nausea and vomiting, although you can see they're grade 1, 2 in nearly all cases. And then there's a spectrum of neurological, which is really an infusional toxicity where patients can have a change in gait, a wobbly or dizziness sensation, um, altered sensations. Um, again, grade one, two in the vast majority, although some grade three events did occur. Again, these completely resolve either with prochlorperazine treatment or just with the end of infusion with no patient coming off or an APR related adverse event, at least in our study, and 30 and 60 day mortality being very low. Otherwise, cytopenia toxicities from hypomethylene agent, including febrile neutropenia being our most common severe adverse event. So overall, a very high number of patients responded. Uh, if you look particularly at the MDS cohort, actually a 50% true complete remission rate. And this was in parallel with a collaboration with the GA GFM who ran another parallel phase two trial with the exact same uh, um, uh, study schema. And you could see very comparable response rates. Um, however, median overall survival was 11 months, was increased in patients who responded um, versus um, did not respond. And when we look at the uh, GFM data, quite similar survival near 12 months, again, potentially better than the seven or eight months from some historical cohorts, and again, responding patients having uh, improved survival versus not. When we look at predictors of response, and I think this is going to be really key in, in, in future study with epronetapop, clearly, if you have a high uh, percentage of this misfolded protein, which you can see just based on standard P53 IHC, this is actually highly concordant just with the presence of P53 mutation, higher than 10% 10, um, 10 or higher was strongly predictive of complete remission rate, speaking somewhat to the mechanism of action. And then looking at the quality of response, so true complete remissions were highly concordant with overall P53 reduction which if you remember, this may be one of the most critical endpoints to look at in prospective clinical trials with much, le much less reductions in non-CR patients and overall no, no response or increase or expansion in non-responding patients. These um, you know, really exciting data led to the design of a phase three trial, which is a one-to-one -one randomized trial of combination therapy versus azacitidine therapy alone with a primary endpoint of complete remission. Actually, about a year ago, these data have press released uh, negative, although CR rate was higher, you could see 33 versus 22.4. It did not reach statistical significance with a p-value of 0.13. Um, I really look forward to um, ideally presenting these data in, in, in a near uh, future meeting because I think uh, what is the survival differences? Are there um, subsets of patients? What was different in the phase three versus phase two so that we can continue to tr help move this agent forward? With that being said, I think there's some very um, uh, um, exciting and interesting data um, to be presented at this um, ASH Congress uh, with two oral presentations, one of which I'll present uh, with, uh, uh, again, with a combined collaboration of all the GFM and US data with Thomas Clouseau and others, where we look at long-term outcomes and predictors of, of, of improved survival, particularly in the transplanted group of patients. Um, there's a triplet AML that is a poster presentation, and then a very interesting post-transplant maintenance study. Really think about total care of these patients, getting your optimal molecular remission, potentially having um, HMA or HMA combination therapy as maintenance may further overall improve the long-term outcomes. And I think the data that Dr. Mishra will be presenting from our center um, are quite striking uh, uh, to be presented at ASH. Well, what else is going on? Of course, HMA venetoclax has been a paradigm shift in elderly AML. Although now multiple groups have shown the P53 AML subset 
has not had improved survival at all with really a survival between five and six months. But what about in high-risk MDS? So these were uh, data presented at this past ASCO. I think that you know, the overall response rate is quite great, clearly better than HMA therapy alone, but that true complete remission rate, which seems to matter the most in high-risk MDS, is only 16%, again, very comparable to single agent HMA. So the quality of response appears to be uh, much less. I think what the survival is um, will be something to look forward to maybe at uh, this ASH symposium, we'll see some updates in this group as well. Well, what else is out there? So um, I think one of the other exciting therapies focused on the P53 mutant subset has been uh, the um, evaluation of therapies targeting CD47. So nice work from the Stanford group a while back showed in RAEB patients or high, um, as well as a separate publication in high risk. You can see both the pro me signal, which is calreticulin, and CD47 had increased expression in the high risk subsets versus normal or lower risk MDS. And then if we look at um, magrolimab, which is the first in class macrophage immune checkpoint that basically blocks it. So again, CD47 expressed on the cancer cell, SERP alpha on the macrophage. Essentially, this is bestly shown in the video with cancer cells in green and macrophages in orange. There's really no phagocytosis whatsoever. Whereas in the presence of, of magrolimab, you get this rapid induction of phagocytosis. Critical is the cancer cell has to express a pro me signal, which calreticulin being the prototypic one. And this is largely not expressed on non-cancer cells, really allowing for selective elimination overall. And so these data um, uh, led to some preclinical modeling first where azacitidine was able to robustly increase calreticulin expression and an aggressive AML xenograft model combination therapy significantly improved survival versus either uh, monotherapy agent alone with all mice really being disease-free. And thus the balance or tipping of this pro eat me signal may be really the critical uh, mechanism for synergy. And when we think about other novel combinations, um, agents that can further tip this balance may uh, have excitement. Um, interesting, venetoclax, as an example, has been able, uh, shown by several groups now to increase uh, pro me signals and have synergy with 47 agents as well. But focusing on the data um, that we've been presenting with magrolimab and azacitidine, the tolerability has been, um, has been excellent. It does cause on-target anemia. So the only normal um, cells that clearly express increased pro me signals are older aged red blood cells. And thus we use a priming dose to mitigate that, but still for cycle, you can have on target anemia with an average um, drop of between 0.5 and one grams per deciliter, although some patients having a higher drop. And thus we keep them at a higher transfusion threshold, typically somewhere um, closer to nine grams per deciliter, at least through cycle one. But otherwise no increased cytopenia toxicity. We had no early deaths at the last data presentation. And immune-related adverse events, um, unfortunately, were um, um, did not occur, which is a critical difference between sort of your traditional PD-1, PD-L1 agents, where um, there's been some considerable toxicity in patients with myeloid malignancy. So what about overall response rate? So focusing on the MDS, a vast majority of patients um, responded with a 42% true complete remission rate. And importantly, and I think speaking to the immune-related myeloid you know, um, targeting is that responses did deepen over time. So the CR rate was even better if you look at patients that were on therapy for six months. Responses did occur more rapidly than ASA alone with almost all patients who have increased blast at baseline, having a reduction as seen in the um, waterfall plot on the right, the asterisk marking patients without increased blast at baseline. And importantly, at least at the last data presentation, no median overall survival was met, although relatively short follow-up. There was a little bit of data focused on P53 for patients, again, with a 75% response rate, 50% um, uh, having true complete remission rate. But notably in these patients, they had a really excellent reduction um, in the variant allele frequency. And this is a, you know, a biallelic complex cytogenetic patient at baseline, speaking again to that prognostic group of patients with the poorest of outcomes. And then overall, I think it's quite clear that there is a high degree of overlap between uh, P53 higher risk MDS and AML, which is often in an oligoblastic state. So the, um, we have a lot more data, which we presented at ASH of last year, or actually now two years ago, um, 
where uh, p53 uh, mutant patients indeed uh, had a high response rate early on and so the trial was amended to only in include this group so very similar response rates across the board but i think what was more exciting although the follow-up was short was we now have a median os of 13 months and although that would still mean we have a ways to go this is about double of what we've seen uh, in other cohorts such as hma ven and this is actually the largest you know p53 aml cohort uh, put together so with that, I think it's an exciting time. I think it's a time we really need to focus on new and prospective trials for our patients. But with that, I'd like to thank some amazing collaborators um, that were part of the clinical trial um, that you see. And then uh, uh, my funding sources, which have included the uh, MDS Foundation, particularly in the setting of some of the uh, Epernetapop work, um, as well as some funding from the Dresdner Foundation. And uh, with that, I look forward to the discussion section of today's uh, meeting. Thank you.